Okay, welcome back. And uh, we're still on our series, What Happens uh, When You Die. This is part three. Uh, we're going to be dealing uh, with our daily deeds uh, from the Apocalypse of Paul, verses uh, uh, 7 through 10. All right, so we're going to start here at verse 7. And it said, Behold, then, you children of men, the creature is subject unto Elohim, but mankind alone sinneth. Therefore, you children of men, bless ye you, Yahuwah Elohim, without ceasing at all hours and on all days, but especially when the sun sets. For in that hour do all the angels go unto Yahuwah to worship him and to present the deeds of men, which every man doeth from morning until evening, whether they be good or evil. And there is an angel that goeth forth rejoicing from the man in whom he dwelleth, and another goeth with a sad countenance. And when therefore the sun is set at the first hour of the night, in the same hour goeth the angel of every people and of every man and woman which protect and keep them, because man is the image of Elohim. And likewise, at the hour of morning, which is the twelfth hour of the night, do all the angels of men and women go to meet Elohim and present all the work which every man has wrought, whether good or evil. And every day and night do the angels present unto Elohim the account of all the deeds of mankind. Unto you, therefore, I say, O children of men, bless ye Yahuwah Elohim without ceasing all the days of your life. Now he puts this emphasis on doing this without ceasing because we are all assigned uh, angels that report on us on a daily Every deed that we do, everything that we say, every, you know, all these things are recorded, and each day they're presented before the Most High at, uh, you know, at certain at a certain hour. You know, this is why when you get into the Psalm, Psalm thirty-four, you you see the psalmist saying, "I will bless you who at all times." His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in Yahuwah. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Why is the psalmist saying this? Because the psalmist understands that there's one who's taking account of everything that's being done. And if I'm going to do something, I'm going to bless Yahuwah at all times. So that when the angel takes my report back, all that the angel will have would be a good report. And so the psalmist is saying, I will bless Yahuwah at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And this is an eye opener because it, you know, if we hadn't looked at it from this perspective, then we see how important it is on a daily basis to live our lives because everything's been recorded, everything's been taken before the Most High, whether it's good or bad, whether it's a good report or a bad report is being taken, it's being recorded and taken before Him. And if we can follow in the in the in the guidance of the Psalms and say, if we're going to say anything or do anything, I want it to bless you who at all times, and so I want. I want the angel that represents me before the Most High to have something good uh, to take back. All right. And so he's talking about that. And we see in, in 2 Corinthians that, you know, uh, that that's being taken account of because this is going to be uh, part of our judgment. And he said, we, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of, uh, of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. And so uh, when you look at it from that perspective, he's saying it's being recorded and we've got to deal with it at some point, everything, you know, we're going to deal with everything. So, you know, he's, he's telling us, uh, you know, in this apocalypse of Paul, he's showing, you know, he's demonstrating specifically how uh, these things, you know, are happening. All right. So as we move forward, it says, at the hour appointed, therefore, all the angels, everyone rejoicing, come forth before Elohim together to meet him and worship him at the hours that is set. And lo, suddenly at the set time there was a meeting, and the angels came to worship in the presence of Elohim, and the Spirit came forth to meet them, and there was a voice saying, Which come ye, our angels, bringing burdens of news? They answered and said, We are come from them that have renounced the world for the holy name's sake, wandering as strangers in the caves of the rocks and weeping every hour that they dwell on the earth and hungering and thirsting for thy name's sake with their loins girt, 
holding in their hands the incense of their heart and praying and blessing at every hour, suffering anguish and subduing themselves, weeping and lamenting more than all that dwell on earth. And we that are their angels do more with them. Whether therefore it pleases thee, command us to go and minister, lest they do otherwise, but the poor more than all that dwell on the earth. The sense required is shown by the Greek is that the angels ask that these good men may continue in goodness. All right, so we see uh, this in Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11 is talking about uh, men of faith. And it goes through all the way through Hebrews 11, talking about those who live by faith. And we get we get down in there, we get around verse 32, and it basically uh, starts describing what, uh, you know, the same type people, uh, you know, that the apocalypse of, of, of Paul was talking about, who, you know, living in caves and going uh, through all the mockings and all these things they're going through for the name of Yah. So Hebrews 32, and it says, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and Samson and of Jephthah and of David and Samuel and all of the prophets, who through faith do kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of the lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel markings and scourges, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, and in mountains, and in dens, and caves of the earth. And these all, having attained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Elohim having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And so he gives this, this crew of people who had not received the promise. Well, what's the promise? The promise of, of you know, of this new kingdom the promise of the indwelling of the Holy Ruler, all the things that are associated with that. They didn't receive uh, all of those things, but yet they went through all of these uh, uh, these trials, believing on the name of Yahuwah. And so when we get back to the Apocalypse of Paul, the, you know, the, we know that that's the group that he's talking about because he said, no, you're not that from henceforth my grace shall be established with you and mine help. And he's talking about the Holy Rook. And mine help, which is my dearly beloved son, shall be with them. And he's saying his son shall be with them through the Holy Rook. Shall be with them, ruling them at all times. And he shall minister unto them and never forsake them, for their place is in his habitation. When then these angels departed, lo, there came other angels to worship in the presence of the majesty, to meet therewith, and they were weeping. And the spirit of Elohim went forth to meet them, and the voice of Elohim came, saying, Whence are you come, our angels, bearing burdens, ministers of the news of the world? They answered and said in the presence of Elohim, We are come from them which have called upon thy name, and the snares of the world have made them wretched, devising many excuses at all times, and not making so much as one pure prayer out of their whole heart all the time of their life. Wherefore, then must we be with men that are sinners. And the voice of Elohim came unto them. You must minister unto them until they turn and repent. But if they return not to me, I will judge them. And he says again, Know therefore, o children of men, that whatsoever is wrought by you, the angels tell it unto Elohim, whether it be good or evil. Now, we see the uh, angels going back, this group of angels going back, and they have bad news, and they, they're they saying they've been caught up by the snare of, of the world. And he's still saying, yeah, but I need you to uh, look after them, you know, in case they repent. So we had the one group that he was referring to, uh, you know, that, you know, had went through extreme circumstances in order to try to follow the ways of Yahuwah. And then we had the other group 
who is getting caught up by the snares of the world. And this is even, uh, you know, alluding to uh, those who of his elect of Israel, who when he called them to the wedding, you know, everybody said, you know, I got things to do. I got, you know, I got just got married. I need to take care of that. You know, somebody else went and said, you know, well, I got to go take care of my farm and got caught up in the cares uh, of the world. And he said, well, you know, keep talking to him. You know, uh, maybe they'll return. If not, I would judge them. And so it's all of these things that, you know, that, you know, you know, we that can cause us to get caught up in the world and not put our focus on the most high. All right. So when we look back and he talks, he talks in here and he says, uh, know ye not that from henceforth my grace shall be established with you in my help. You know, we go to John 14 and this is the promise that uh, Yeshua had, uh, you know, with the disciples. And he was saying, these things have I spoken unto you being yet present with you, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he's promising uh, that from that point on, after he's uh, resurrected, that he's sending uh, a comforter, comforter uh, for them. So he's going to be with them in the form uh, of the comforter. All right. And we also see uh, in Matthew 13, which we'll probably get into uh, in a later lesson, where he's he's giving examples of those who are faithful versus those who are caught up. And then he gives examples of how they're caught up in the world. And he explains this parable in Matthew 13. He says, and he's talking about the, the it's the parable of the sower. And he said, when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth the seed by the wayside. Then he says, but he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and Adam with joy receiveth it. So he was excited about the word, receives the word. But he said, yet has he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of that word, by and by he is offended. All right. And then he's got this disturbing. He said, he that received the word, among, uh, uh, received the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he become unfruitful. But then it says, but he that received seed into the ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also bear fruit and bring forth some hundredfold, some sixty some 30 so he's talking about now he's talking about being fruitful uh in the kingdom so we see uh the these different levels of how people are receiving the, uh, the word and so you know the judgment still comes you know uh, how we receive it what we do with it good or bad you know all those things are going to be taken into account for even the words of our mouth are going to be accounted for. You know, every word that we speak. And so in Matthew 12, he talks about this. And he said, whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy, Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. You know, this is uh, also what we could talk about lukewarmness. You, you, you can't have both. You, you got to be one or the other. And he says, oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words shall, uh, shall be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So that's pretty powerful in context of what we're, what we're saying. So every, all the words that are coming out of our mouth, uh, you know, we got to give them to account. James talks about this as well. 
And he was saying uh, that we can't control our own tongue in and of ourselves. We need help controlling our own tongue. And he said, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of Elohim. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brother. These things ought not so to be. So he's saying, you know, it's this lukewarmness again. So he's saying, you know, we, we praise most high, we, we we give him, you know, all this, uh, you know, uh, accolades. And then we look at our brother who's made after him, who's after made after his likeness and curse him. You know, and he, he said it doesn't make sense that we do these things. Then he asked the question, does the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, uh, my brother, bear olive berries, eat up fine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? So he's 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 talking about this lukewarmness again. And so when we see these things in ourselves, that on the one hand we're always talking about the most high, on the other hand we 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 we're, we're putting, you know, his his uh, his people down all the time, you know, and, and you know on the one hand blessing him, and on the other hand you know, cursing our brother. He said, we, that's a problem. And so we really need to, we need to work on those things. All right. And in Luke 15, 10, he said, likewise, I said to you, there's joy in the presence of God of one sinner that repents. So we go back then to where he was saying that, the, you know, the angels are excited, you know, when, you know, and they rejoice in heaven when they get good reports. And Luke 15 is talking about they received a good report. And someone has confessed most high with their mouth. And they believe in their heart. And the angels are excited. And they're excited, you know, when we repent. They're excited, you know, when 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 his elect turn away from how they're living. And they rejoice in the presence. So we see that in the Apocalypse of Paul. We see the angels rejoicing going before the presence of the most high. All right, so um, just a few examples also of the assembly that we, we that we discussed at the beginning when we were saying that the angels meet before the Most High. You know, is that in the in the KJV? Of course it is. So we go to Job uh, one one, uh, you know, one five one six two one and thirty eight seven. We see the sons of Elohim. We see them uh, assembling before the Most High. So let's read it. it Job 1 5. He said, It was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. But Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. Thus did Job continue. So you see Job, and he is, he, he's blessing the Most High continually. So the angels are taking things continually before the Most High on Job's behalf. The Most High is receiving these things. That's why, you know, he, he can he can look at, the, uh, you know, uh, Satan and say, have you considered my servant Job? All right. And so and then in Job 1 and 6, he said, now there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah. So we see this assembly that we're talking about. Uh, it was this, this particular day uh, when they came together. They were coming together all the time, but he's he's pointing out a particular day when they came together to present themselves before Yahuwah. And Satan came also among them. And this is when he said, you know, have you considered my servant Job? So that's why he's talking about a particular day. And then he talks about another day when he brings up Job again in, in Job 2 and 1. He says, again, there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah and Satan came also among them to present himself before Yahuwah so we see them presenting themselves before the most high because this is one of those things they have to do on a daily basis and present what we've done in our body both good and bad uh, to the most high all right and when when most high was uh you know when he was chastising Job 
uh, he asked him a question, uh, you know, that he couldn't answer. And he said, when when the morning stars sang together, all the sons of Elohim shouted for joy. He was saying, were you there for that? Can you answer the questions about that? So we continually see this assembly uh, in the heavens, the angels, uh, you know, and uh, getting before the Most High. We see them, the presentation of the, uh, of the uh, blessings uh, of before the Most High. We also see another example in 1 Kings 22. King Ahab uh, was wanting to go to war, and he, you know, he was uh, uh, king of the uh, northern kingdom, and Jehoshaphat was the king of the southern kingdom, Judah. And he went and he was trying to have an alliance with Jehoshaphat because he wanted to go to war. Uh, and so Rahab's prophets came to him and told him, hey, y'all, you're going to win the war. You're going to do it. But Jehoshaphat did not trust because Ahab, you know, was, you know, was an evil king. He didn't trust the prophets of Ahab. And so he said, is there not another prophet that we can consult before we go into war? So they went and got Micaiah. And the king said to him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of Yahuwah? And so he told him the truth. Micaiah told him the truth. He said, I saw all Israel scattered up on the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And Yahuwah said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me, but evil? And he said, hear thou therefore the word of Yahuwah. I saw Yahuwah sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. So the prophet is telling, uh, you know, Ahab that you're going you're gonna to get all your men killed. And the king of Israel is looking at Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, look, he, he won't ever tell me anything good, you know. And so the prophet comes back and says, well, listen, I see you who are sitting on his throne, all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his, on his left. So he's seeing this assembly in heaven. And Yahuwah says, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before Yahuwah and said, I will persuade him. And Yahuwah said to him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. All right. So you see this assembly in heaven. You see him gather and you see him sending a lying spirit to Ahab, which ended up they, he, they believed the lie of the prophets and they went ahead. And it was a catastrophe you know, for them. So we still see uh, this assembly uh, in the heavens. All right. So, um, you know, in Daniel also, we see an example of uh, of the angels acting on the behalf uh, of mankind, going from man back into the presence of the Most High. In Daniel 10, Daniel had been praying uh, because he knew that the 70 years in Babylon was about up and he was praying. Uh, to the Most High about that situation. And the angel came back and he said uh, unto Daniel, he said, Oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before Elohim, thy words were heard. And I came for thy words. But the prince of the king of Persia was withstood me one and twenty days. Below Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became done. So you see this angel. You know, because Daniel, uh, you know, was was reaching out to the Most High, there was an angel there to take, uh, you know, this uh, 
this plea before the Most High on his behalf. And uh, on his way, going through the first and second heavens that we talked about, uh, you know, the last time, uh, he runs into the, uh, the the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And, you know, and, you know, he was trying to keep him from going into, uh, the you know, the third heavens on up to give this message. And it took Michael to come uh, help free him up. But we see the, these things going on in scripture. You know, all of these things are happening is there. So this, you know, everything's, you know, it's, it's just confirmation when we see these things. All right. And then uh, finally in the book of Revelation, we see uh, the angel in Revelation 8 and 3. It said another, another angel came, stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of, of, of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before uh, the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before Elohim out of the angel's hand. And so, you know, it's just showing us when we pray uh, that, you know, the the angels, uh, you know, go, they get the coals or the fire from from hell basically because you know that what we used to do with the in the um in the tabernacle and in the temple we would go get the coals of fire from the altar and we would bring the altar coals of fire from the altar we would burn incense on it signifying that in order for our prayers to go into the heavens we're under we're, we're praying in the name of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf and the most high smells the sweet smell of that sacrifice and he receives our prayer. So when we see the angel, uh, you know, burning the incense. He, the angel, has literally got the coals from 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 the fires of hell, and you know, burning the incense on that coal, representing that Yeshua has gone to the depths of hell for us, and that we're praying in His name. And and it's a sweet smelling Savior to the Most High because He can hear our prayer because of what his son did so it's an awesome picture but we can we can get into that uh, more uh, as we go along but I just wanted us to see uh when, when we when we get into this and we start talking about uh the angels going before the most high to these meetings and all these things these things are also uh in the kjv but you know it just amplifies a bit more uh, when it comes to the judgment when we get into the apocalypse of paul so I'm going to end it right there. And so just uh, look over these things and then we're going to move on uh, in our next lesson, uh, uh, starting with uh, starting with verse 11. Show on. Now, I believe that the feast day cards are a powerful tool for three major reasons. Uh, number one, the Messiah fulfilled and will continue to fulfill his uh, redemptive work surrounding these particular days. The feast days are actually the only biblical holidays or holy days that he affirms in scripture, not Easter, Christmas, Valentine's. You know, those days are actually dedicated to other gods. And number two, prophecy. Uh, these cards present teaching moments. And uh, one of the main emphasis on the card is prophecy. So the third reason that these cards are so powerful is that when possible, we have actual historical representations of true Israel. We also include on the cards where the images are now located. So this is an opportunity to discuss the meaning of the feast days uh, from a messianic perspective. Also, it's a teaching moment on specific prophecies, and it also opens up discussions about the images of true Israel.